But today is a presentation that uh, I'll introduce you all to, which is the storytell uh, the concept of storytelling and leveraging that as the power of, uh, for cultural reclamation of the narrative. I'll also be going into the concept of healing-centered engagement. Many of you might be familiar with trauma-informed care, for example, um, but we'll go into healing-centered engagement and can, kind of how that adds another lens to trauma-informed care approaches. Um, feel free to continue to introduce yourselves in the chat. I always like getting to know who's in the room. Um, and then uh, for those two, uh, we've also, I've always gotten got good feedback on my racial truth playlist that is open to the public. So I've posted a link to our uh, racial truth and reconciliation Virginia playlist online, um, which covers a different genres of music, but essentially are all rooted in social justice in the spirit of Black History Month. Right, so moving along, I'll give you um, uh, uh, more information about Voices for Virginia's Children, which is the Commonwealth's only multi-issue child advocacy organization across the state of Virginia. And we specialize in a variety of issues, mental health, health, um, trauma and from uh, care, equity, and social justice um, through our Racial Truth and Reconciliation Virginia campaign. Um, you also find that we cover uh, other issues uh, such as child welfare, foster care, uh, essentially um, voices as always will be paired with the Kids Count Data Center and there are several organizations similar to ours across the state, but ideally all data informed um, as well as uh, working to achieve equitable policies for Virginia's children. I won't go into a, a, a whole lot around as far as my uh, professional credentials goes um, or receipts, but I do hold a master's of public policy, proud one of the first two in my family with a master's degree. Um, I'm the founder of the Racial Truth and Reconciliation Virginia Campaign at Voices, and much of my work has been recognized across the state of Virginia, um, including um, by the Valentine as a Richmond history maker for the social justice category. If you're interested in learning more about me, you can always visit um, uh, the Voices for Virginia Children's website or my website at chloeiedwards.com. Now you'll get to learn a lot of the, with the professional perspectives that uh, bring uh, me to this work. I want to first introduce you to the concept of diversity welcomes. Um, and really, as an, I, uh, give, we'll give you an example of that following the slides, but I know that when we enter you know, professional environments, we often don't quite uh, introduce the personal pieces that shape why we do the work that we do. And so this presentation will really uh, begin to break apart um, really and critical thinking about us, we as people, in addition to our professions. So there's a variety of ways you'll see on the agenda that I will go into that. Um, but for the sake of time, I'm going to go ahead and jump right in. So now beginning, uh, and you all are welcome to join me in this diversity welcome, but the purpose of a diversity welcome is to affirm the personal seen and unseen identities that shape who we are as people, validate them and welcome them into the space. So this is the practice that I begin, um, have begun using as a racial equity facilitator as well um, when I enter different spaces um, to begin making others more comfortable with the concept of uh, diversity welcomes. So my name is Chloe Edwards. I identify as a Black woman. I'm one of two people in my family uh, with a master's degree in particular of public policy. Um, I also identify as a, a kinship foster care alum of Virginia's uh, child welfare system. I identify as a sister, a daughter. Um, I see some folks are having uh, connections and I'm, I know that someone earlier had mentioned trouble with the connections. My connection is fully all bars here though, but for others that um, may have difficulty with connections, try turning off your screen. Um, uh, sometimes I know that that helps or uh, I'm not quite sure are we starting. Um, but if we continue to have those connections, please post in the chat um, in the event that I need to restart on my end. Okay, thanks. Uh, 
So welcome other folks to join in on the diversity welcome. Again, my name is Chloe Edwards. I identify as a black woman. I also identify as an alum of uh, Virginia's kinship foster care system, uh, a survivor of PTSD. I'm also a dog mom to a service animal amongst other identities that I want to affirm the identities that others may bring into this space and, and welcome them here as we get started. Um, feel free to model that in the chat if you'd like to. Sometimes I have people say, come up to me and say, well, you know, I really got to think about, you know, my diversity welcome, uh, Chloe, and that's okay as well. So I um, want to also welcome and, and provide a content warning that this workshop may have triggering content and images. You'll find that my style is honesty. And as a result, I don't necessarily sugarcoat um, the materials for the comfort of others. My materials are direct, and as a result, you may feel some uh, discomfort. I like to encourage brave spaces rather than the idea of, spa of safe spaces, um, because everyone does not have access to safety. You may feel um, a sense of fragility. I encourage folks to acknowledge it in the moment, focus on perhaps what brought you to this workshop and the intention of the workshop. It's okay to take a break. Um, I know we're on webinar, but also okay to um, turn off your screen, et cetera, get up if you need to. So as we get started, um, and welcome, uh, uh, enjoy those participating in the diversity welcome as well. Um, I want to start off with just a five finger breath. You'll find me practicing mindfulness throughout this presentation. It does have some uh, race-based triggering content. And so I want to get started off on the right foot and all taking a moment to engage in a five finger breath. So we're gonna get started. Go ahead into your first finger and you wanna breathe up. And breathe down as you bring that finger back in. Again, the next finger, breathe up. Breathe back in. I'm going to go to the third finger, breathe in, and breathe out as you bring that finger back Then I'm going to go to the fourth finger, breathe up, down as you bring that finger back in, and then last finger, bring up, breathe up, and then back down as you bring that finger back in, uh, down. All right, now let's go ahead and get started and, and hone in on that brave space as we continue out throughout the presentation. So as we talk about um, uh, storytelling as a tool of cultural um, reclamation of the narrative, I wanna introduce you all to many uh, racial equity facilitators may be familiar with this I Am From poem um, by the following uh, George Lyon and Beverly Tatum. And so I'm gonna go ahead and get started with, you know, taking it back right, right into an I Am From poem, which more creative form of storytelling. You don't necessarily have to be an artist, although I am one by trade and will we precursor that to participate in creative forms of cultural uh, narrative reclamation. So for those who would like to, um, following, I'm going to recite my version of the poem, but for those who want to work on drafting your I am from poems, the, um, the outline is right here on the screen, and I'll be sure to include these in the uh, materials. I am from chronological gospel melodies blasting from my mother's CD player from the strap of racist slaveholders and the resistant arms of slaves. I am from the tan and green house on a hill near the good schools and house poor pockets and sacrifices. I am from trees without soil whose roots shaved and frayed yet fluffed by heritage. I am from the good trouble of freedom writers and agitators marching for Dr. King's dreams and the welling prayers of single mother raising triplets, choosing between work, child care, and survival. I am from crab legs on top of newspapers, drunken slurs, spades, prayers to Jesus, and beers. From what happens in this house stays in this house, and childless hoods, parental circumcised, 
circumstances, cycles of poverty, cocaine binges, incarceration, and foster care, and generational game changers and change breakers. I am from when two or more gathered stand together with faith as small as a mustard seed, we can move mountains and the soothing melodies of Tasha Cobb singing breaking the chains, breaking the chains, breaking the chains. I am from triplet meetings filled with mud pies under the baby tree. I am from a home, but am homeless and native to the unfamiliar homes of Nigeria, Cameroon, and Congo. From Nana's fried chicken, barbecue ribs, candy yams, and seafood salad, and grandma's sweet potato tarts homemade pound cake and pecan pie. I am from forced subjugation to America and dreams deferred but not forgotten. I am from the moments. What just is is not just is, that we take care of our own so that one day they, we will truly know home. Great job, Clement, participating in that I am from poem too. So other folks, if um, I, I like to say I am a poet by trade, but it doesn't necessarily have to, uh, you don't have to be a major in English to create this poem. Um, so feel free to practice on your own or if you get inspired and wanna post a line or two, feel free to do so. Thank you folks. So now, you know, we're gonna continue to hone in on this um, concept of where we're from, right? And, and really the, the piece of intention of that poem is to continue to connect to um, our social identities and lean on to our similarities as well as our differences um, to achieve justice. So I want us to first begin with a moment of mindfulness and reflection as we ground ourselves on the land that we currently stand on. In 1838, Cherokee or indigenous peoples were forcibly moved from their homeland and relocated to Oklahoma. Now, indigenous people were uh, forcibly taken. It was known as uh, the Trail of, Trail of Tears. They walked thousands of miles. And we remember their stories in particular. Reclaiming Narrative Truth is a national effort to foster cultural, social, and policy change by empowering indigenous people to counter discrimination, invisibility, and the dominant narratives that limit native opportunity, access to justice, health, and self-determination. So reclaiming Native Truth's goal is to move hearts and minds toward greater respect, inclusion, and justice for Indigenous people. And so I invite you to acknowledge your ancestors, those who are not no longer with us, as we enter this space. And um, folks can, if you choose to participate, respond with an ashe, which is a West African proverb and means the power to make things happen, or so let it be as we heal. Now, as I do that, um, you can also acknowledge the native lands you're from by using that link on the chat. I'm gonna go ahead and um, type it in too. Let's see. Um, and then there are also resources uh, because as we honor um, indigenous lands, I want to make sure we honor them intentionally and connecting folks to resources to um, intentionally contribute to a further reclamation of, of their narrative. Now, as we continue on with Black History Month, I want to honor my um, uncle Ronald who marched in the and Dr. King's 1963 March on Washington, as well as my aunt Gwendy, who uh, is, was a, a freedom writer in responding with an ashe um, in memory of my ancestors. For others that wish to participate, continue to do so. And I will um, look at the, the chat to take heed. Um, as far as native lands today, I am on the Utenon or the Powhatan lands, which is in Henrico, Virginia. Now let's go ahead and get del delve into this concept of why change and why do I bring here you here today to talk about the reclamation of the narrative. So I'll begin by saying that while the United States of America is known as one of the most the diverse um, democracies in the world, we have to recognize that much of its history entails systems of violence, exclusion, and discrimination. And so in exploring the creation of America, right, 
and our core fundamental values of inclusion, this process alone was exclusive. We have to acknowledge that. And so I'll take you back to the Federal Constitution Convention, which took place in 1787 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And the purpose of this convention was to determine how America would be governed as a nation. Now, the following seven figures are known as John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and George Washington, all of which whom played critical and substantial roles in the development of America's government as a nation. However, these individuals were all recognizably older white males. And upon examining America's reckoning, which it is an addiction to racism, we must simultaneously recognize that the communities most impacted by racism, right, were never included in the nation's core fundamental values, principles, policy, and therefore were inherently excluded. Additionally, when we analyze principles such as this law of self-interest, as we call it in politics, the white dominant majority who remain privileged to date historically benefit from said oppression. And so let's unpack this further when we analyze the role of these founding fathers and how they contributed to what referred to as honorable statesmanship in which I had to learn about in college, yet played a role in the perpetuation in the most horrendous wrongdoing such as slavery and furthermore are praised for it. So this further uh, describes how racism permeates itself in our society. I'll give you an example of even when I grew up, um, I got my master's degree at Liberty University, we had a whole curriculum in honoring these founding fathers as statesmen. I decided to write about the slaves instead. However, this goes to show you how these ideologies um, subsequently are passed down from generation to generation. I hear that, Karen. Glad you chose some good trouble work yourself too. So why do this takes me to the point of why I tell the truth um, behind the narrative. And I wanna first address this concept of reverse racism. So let's talk about it, let's dive right in. There are two cases in history in which I could painfully, which I would do today, compare and contrast, um, which was Nat Turner's rebellion and, um, to Emmett Till. For folks interested in the story of Emmett Till, there's this uh, Hulu um, documentary called Women of the Movement as well, where you can uh, really listen to his story. But let's talk about reverse racism. So Nat Turner's rebellion, also known as the Southampton uh, Insurrection, was a rebellion of enslaved Virginians that took place in Southampton County, Virginia in August of 1831, led by Nat Turner. Now the rebels killed between 55 and 65 people, at least 51 of whom were, yes, white. Now Nat Turner destroyed the myth that slaves were happy and too content to rebel, which by greatly was, was a really great fear um, in, that, in that timeline. Now, after the uh, revolt in Southampton, communities and state legislators across the South considered the implementation of new harsher restrictions against enslaved and freed uh, African Americans. In the months that followed, let me depict for you what followed Nat Turner's rebellion. Revised slave codes were passed in numerous Southern states, including Virginia, who served as the lead for that. Slaves had few legal rights, in court, their testimony was inadmissible in any litigation involving whites. They could make no contract, nor could they own property. Even if attacked, they could not strike a white person. There were numerous restrictions to enforce, enforce social control. Slaves could not be away from their owner's, per, owner's premises without permission. They could not assemble unless a white person, a person was present. They could not own firearms. They could not be taught to read or write, nor could they transmit or, or, or process or possess uh, literature, they were not permitted to marry. So Virginia was the leading state in enforcement of these uh, the, the revision of slave codes. Now let's talk about the case of Emmett Till. I don't have as much to write about the response to that, but Emmett Till was 14 years old in 1955, but plans to visit his uncle Moses in Mississippi from Chicago. Two very different states, especially during this time period. Now his murderers were found not guilty by an all white jury. His death sparked the whole civil rights movement. 
On January 24th, 1956, Luck Magazine even published the confessions of his killers, two white men who were acquitted, but covered, but in this moment were covered by double jeopardy. 65 years later, after 14 year old Emmett Till was lynched in Mississippi, Congress approved legislation designating lynching as a hate crime under federal law. This occurred in the year 2020. So with that being said, when we look at the response to Nat Turner's rebellion, numerous forms of social control, uh, control supported by law and policy versus Emmett Till, let's again go back to that question of reverse racism. Is it a myth? I would argue, yes, it is a myth. And even today, you can argue that there are more modern forms of um, injustice or lynching, such as what occurred in Emmett Till's case in the form of police brutality, which we again saw the resurfacing of the Black Lives Matter movement that same year in 2020. So I'm gonna let one of my favorite uh, movies and shows um, kind of summarize uh, this point. The role of counterculture is to wake up the mainstream. I have furniture in you. Counterculture? Is that what you think this is? Your little show? What about my show? The show is racist. Black people can't be racist. Prejudice, yes, but not racist. Racism describes a system advantage based on race. Black people can't be racist since we don't stand to benefit from such a system. Your antics are making press, Sam. This keeps men like President Fletcher up at night. Or Mel. He's building a file on you. Okay, it's not my fault that your son couldn't beat me in an election. The role okay, of- I'm gonna leave it there. Oh, okay. But, um, let me go back one. So to summarize, and this is Dear White People, folks um, want to watch that movie and show. Uh, but Tim Wise explains further um, for white individuals, when a group of people such as racialized individuals has little or no power over you institutionally, they don't get to define the terms of your existence. They can't limit your opportunities. And you needn't worry about the use of a slur to describe you and yours, since in all likelihood, the slur is as far as it will go. What are they gonna do, deny you a bank loan? Yeah, right. White perceptions are what end up counting in a white dominated society. If whites say indigenous people are savages, be they of noble or vicious type, then by God, they'll be seen as savages. If indigenous people say whites are mayonnaise eating Amway salespeople, then who is gonna care if anything, whites will simply turn it into a marketing opportunity. So the key here y'all is when you have the power, you can afford to be self-deprecating after all, and this is derived from the myth of uh, reverse racism is my source. Now, I'll cover this because I'm gonna get into Dr. Angela Joy, Joy Degree today too, but the mistreatment of white people is not to be confused with, with racism. Racism requires superiority, privilege and power. Thus reverse racism is a myth because people of color cannot reassert privilege and power at the detriment of white people. And when we really think about it, what is the worst thing that can happen when a white person is racist towards a black person? Slavery, maternal infant mortality disparities, police brutality. What is the worst thing that can happen when a black person is presumably racist towards a white person? Oftentimes the response is white fear, like in the case of um, Nat Turner, is what we can expect. And so Dr. Angela Joy DeGru, uh, one of my shows also goes into this as well in some of her uh, lectures. Now moving on, uh, now we're gonna get into why do we share um, our stories? And I'm gonna get into the concept of, um, of trauma, but it's important to shift the narrative from, well, I'll get into trauma first. So individual trauma is essentially an individualistic response to um, adverse childhood experiences, which creates trauma. And this can um, be derived from a series of events, a set of circumstances, um, presumably one that affects an individual's physical or emotional, uh, can be uh, uh, um, perceived as emotionally harmful or life-threatening, and it has lasting adverse effects, according to several, several sources. Um, including including the Kaiser Permanente on childhood trauma, as well as the P Pennsylvania um, study. Now, individual stories of trauma shed light 
once we begin to share them, right, collectively, on what could be collective or systemic trauma. Now, we know in the trauma-informed care field that when individuals, uh, especially in their childhood, have experienced adverse childhood experiences, socioeconomic hardship, um, a parent who was abusive, uh, experience of neglect, et cetera, it can be toxic, especially at a young age and triggering three a stress response, fight, flight, freeze, some have more, caught flirt, et cetera. Um, but initially these life uh, altering stress responses that can often cause harm and are led to negative social and health outcomes. Now it's important to shift the narrative perception from critically negative depiction, uh, depictions related to for example, trauma or racial inequity to one that also shares a sense of validity. How do we bridge the gap in thinking when it comes to uh, individuals with um, whose experiences are radically different from our own, right? And so oftentimes self-interest, like I referred to in politics or just in general, people's self-interest can often mask empathy and short supply in some cases or mask the truths behind their experiences related to injustice, which we know it belongs to all of us, regardless of where our ancestors came from. And there are several examples um, of trauma including uh, community violence, domestic violence, school violence, uh, terrorism, uh, we all know uh, abuse, neglect, et cetera. And so um, the listed here are again, some of those risk factors that I alluded to earlier, but has an uh, impact on the way individuals cope um, with complex trauma or adverse childhood experiences. Trauma can also be passed down gener generationally, which I'll get into a bit later today. But while the um, Kaiser Permanente on adverse childhood experiences, which is referred to as the most significant public health survey that no one has, um, that many have no, have no knowledge of, um, due to the time it took to reach public awareness, there was another study done. Now, I want to note that the 1988 ACES study by Kaiser Permanente, it brought together 10 questions about childhood household life um, experiences. Much of them were, were, again, rooted in the household or that individual level. Now, there is also another uh, study that many are not as uh, familiar with. Now, Kaiser Permanente was done in a predominantly white middle to upper class neighborhood of um, participants, and it focused on its own experiences within the home. The other study, known as the Philadelphia ACES Project, was created by members who wondered if living in an urban area might bring particular stresses not covered in the original study. What about community or neighborhood based experiences? And so this study, ultimately done in 2012, 2013, expanded the original um, ACEs, ACEs study to look at the impact of community level adversity, uh, adversities in conjunction with the uh, other study. And so here are some examples of uh, some of those adversity, community level adversities. I presented five extra ones, such as witnessing violence in your community, feeling, feeling discrimination, adverse neighborhood experiences, being bullied, lived in foster care, like I alluded to, I have um, earlier. And so when we talk about um, trauma from care, I often see this disconnect in the field of, of how are we also acknowledging urban experiences, uh, experiences that supersede the individual perspective as well as cultural, racial trauma or um, neighborhood experiences that could be prevalent for in particular black and brown people in addition to the other um, traumas that the, the original study highlighted. So let's get into a uh, racial trauma more further. Racial trauma can have uh, affect several components of a person's life, including their ability to have uh, relationships, concentrate on school or work and feel safe. Now this trauma is widespread amongst marginalized, group marginalized groups, in particular black people in the United States, the majority of whom have expressed that they have experienced racism. Now, often when it comes to racism, we have to prove it. And I wanna also note that uh, when I talk about racism that is different from discrimination or pre uh, prejudice in this way, which I alluded to earlier. 
racism requires uh, is a system of set advantage, advantages based off of superiority towards those who are oppressed. That said, we often prove that racism, right, has to exist in the first place, or I can attest to that as a Black woman. So here is the data, um, which shows that this trauma is widespread amongst marginalized, marginalized groups, in particular Black people in the United States, and the majority of whom have expressed that they have experienced racism. According to a 2019 Pew Research survey, roughly eight in 10 people who identified as Black with some college experience, 81%, reported that they have experienced some form of racial, uh, racial discrimination from time to time, including 17% who expressed this happens to them regularly. So this pattern was consistent across surveys, including a 2016 P research survey and a 2017 uh, NPR poll. Now, when you look at this, uh, these uh, statistics on the screen, I want to notice that Blacks who uh, have attended college are more likely than those who have not to report that they have faced certain situations because of the, their race. Now, this could very likely be due to college, you know, experience, education, etc. I also want to note, uh, well, I'm going to go into that later, that, you know, racism can also very much be internalized. Hmm. Okay, I might get it to into internalized racism after this, but colorblind racism um, is this idea of a colorblind society, while well intentioned, it leaves people without the language to discuss race and examine one's, one's own bias. Um, again, this is all leading up to why uh, storytelling is so expensive to, I mean, uh, 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 important to acknowledge our, our stories and our experiences because colorblind um, racism relies on the concept that race-based differences don't matter. It ignores the realities of, of uh, systemic racism. You know, it often tells someone, well, your experience with racism doesn't matter because, well, I don't see color, right? And then at the end of the day, you're just, you're uh, diminishing uh, or dismissing what someone is saying to you that they've experienced. And so, um, racial color bl uh, blindness often, often serves as a device to disengage from conversations of race and racism uh, in its entirety, which ultimately equates right to more racism for those who are experiencing it day to day. When people come to me with colorblind racism, I often challenge them to say, well, what do you do when you stop at a stoplight? Red, we know means stop. Yellow, we know means slow down. Green, we know means go. And it doesn't have to spell it out to you to know what those means, right? Because at this point, it's subconscious to us. What do you do when you see a stop sign? It doesn't have to say stop on the hexagon. Again, we know that that figure means to stop. And that is how, how subconscious racism is in our society while I'm talking about, you know, stop lights and all that. Now, I alluded to internalized racism earlier, and this racism lies within the individ individual. This type of racism is comprised of our private beliefs and biases about race, often influenced by our, our own cultures. And so this can take, um, uh, this can take many, many forms, including prejudice towards others of different race, internalized oppression, which is the negative belief about oneself by people of color, internalized privilege beliefs about superiority or entitlement by white people. There's also interpersonal racism, um, which occurs between individuals. So this is the bias that um, occurs, you know, when individuals interact with other individuals and influence more individuals, all forms of um, different racism. But a specific example of internalized racism would be the deliberation of Brown versus Board of Education. This is a landmark court case in 1954. Um, that eventually led to the overturning of separate but, uh, but equal. But what they did was consider black and white baby dolls unexpected uh, who served as weapons in the plaintiff's fight against uh, racial discrimi discrimination. And this is performed by a husband and wife duo, Mamie and Kenneth Clark. Um, 
who uh, were uh, African American psychologists and devoted their life's work to helping heal children's racial biases. So during this doll test, as it is now known as a majority of uh, black children showed a preference for dolls with white skin instead of black ones. And this was a consequence, the uh, Clarks argued of the inadvertent effects of segregation. And so while I'm talking about the doll experiment, I want to note that, you know, I'll go into this later, but it also, this also equates to um, while they were helping to heal children, children do grow up unhealed and in internalizing these very same um, ideologies as a result of racism. And so that goes to show you that just because, you know, I'm a black woman, could be standing alongside another black woman, we very much may have different views on uh, the impact of racism in our societies. And we are not uh, a monolith. All right, moving on along, let's see how I'm doing. Ooh, on time, I can get real passionate about these topics, but I think I'm doing okay still. Um, the another thing I'll go into is uh, the concept of post-traumatic slave syndrome, um, which is a theory that explains the adaptive survival behaviors in black communities throughout the United States. It's derived from consequences of multi-generation, uh, multi-generational oppression of Black people and their descendants as a result of uh, trauma slavery. So the belief that Black people were inherently or genetically inferior to whites in, combi in combination with institutionalized racism presents multi-generational trauma uh, coupled with generational oppression. It also uh, presents an absence of opportunity to heal or access the benefits available to society, which further leads to a condition known as post-traumatic slave syndrome or PTSS, which uh, equates to a lack of primary esteem, which comes with feelings of hopelessness, depression, or a general self-destruct outlook. There's also um, could be increased propensity for anger and outbursts, feelings of suspicion, negative motivation of others, violence against self, property, and others, including members of one's own group. Um, internalized uh, racism or racist so socialization, and this contributes to learning, learned behaviors of helplessness, uh, distorted self-image, a deep-seated dislike for the members of one's own ethnic group, customs affiliated with um, cultural, ethnic heritage, and also um, physical characteristics of one's own identified ethnic group can be um, internalized. And so thus, this gets to the next point of uh, epigenetics, which is uh, the argument that trauma can leave a chemical mark on a person's genes and which then does get passed down to subsequent generations, but the mark doesn't directly damage the gene. There's no mutation. Instead, it alters the mechanism by which the gene is converted into, I could get real nerdy with this, functional proteins or expressed. Thus, uh, it isn't genetic, it's epigenetic. So there have been several uh, reports um, that support this by scientists, for example, of um, uh, children with um, prenatal exposure during the period of famine towards the end of World War II, um, survivors of the Holocaust as well, um, um, including the descendants of Holocaust survivors, et cetera, um, all suggesting that we do inherit some trace from our parents' or grandparents' experiences. Okay, now another thing that I will share, I personally deal with is also imposter syndrome. It's, it's also known as imposter phenomenon or fraud syndrome or, or the imposter experience, but all of these words describe a psychological pattern in which an individual doubts their skills, talents, or accomplishments and has a persistent internalized fear of being exposed as a fraud. And, and so I often like to talk about you know, imposter syndrome on, on top of racism, because there is the belief that we have to, in minority communities, work 10 times harder, be 10 times smarter. And for me, I know specifically um, there are different uh, imposter types, but very much I'm the perfectionist, um, 
there is also the the super women feeling that you have to do it all um, or you're not good enough. There's the expert who you know doesn't want to um, ask for help because they feel like they won't you know be perceived as if them they know it all. Or the soloist who wants to do the work by themselves. And so whether you're you know black, white, Latin, Latinx, etc., I find many people can identify with the concept of imposter syndrome, but it very much does overlap with uh, the impacts of racism as well. You know, and so this further brings me into this um, concept of why do we share our stories? And I say this, it's important to shift the narrative perception from these critically negative depictions related to, to um, racial inequality to share a sense of validity. But I also say that um, storytelling validates our lived experiences. It iterates that injustice belongs to all of us, regardless of who your ancestors came from. And then it also shifts the um, more powerful parts of our narratives, which is you know collect uh, collective solidarity and the power of cultural reclamation and challenging um, the the tribulations but also honoring the triumphs. All right, so then um, there is this concept of intersectionality, which I've alluded to several times throughout the presentation, but equality and oppression analyze the way in which the conditions are deeply woven into our everyday experiences in life and the way in which they contribute to large disparities in housing, wealth, education, socioeconomic prosperity. So even when the intersection of these conditions are well recognized, they're often treated as individual domains, but we know that they're not influenced by, right, independent and forces. So this adds to an additional layer of responsibility to recognize the patterns that, that occur across social divisions of disparities, race, gender, class, nationality, as well as physical abilities. So intersectionality ultimately asserts that people are often disadvantaged by multiple sources of oppression, but it commits to the following goals to reformulate the world of ideas so that it incorporates the many overlapping ways that human life is experiences, to convey knowledge by promoting institutional change within institutions, to apply that knowledge, to create a society in which all voices are heard, and to advocate for public policies that are responsive to multiple voices. And so that gets me into, you know, we are not a, mon a monolith. Um, I'll give you an example. Someone could identify as LGBTQ, as well as an indigenous person and a female. So intersectionality examines the dimensions of power and authority internally within minority communities, movements, and even within oneself. I'll give you an example. The feminist movement addresses reproductive rights, equal pay, maternity leave, women's liberation, more. However, I, um, or let's say an indigenous per person may face unique plights such as landlessness, poverty, the plights of indigenous LGBTQ uh, plus people such as hyperviolence against uh, indigenous two-spirit people. So these are all examples of how one movement, right? We're all feminists or women may not quite get to the subcategory. So I often say it's more, um, it can be beneficial to yes, rely on our similarities as humans, but also on our differences. Um, which may, you know, maybe the founding fathers would have took a look around and noticed there were no differences in that room when they came up with the a nation's foundings. Maybe we could have included more people of different identities. So that just goes uh, as an example. So I argue that it's important to shift the narrative of perception from yes, what happened to us. What happened, you know, oftentimes we say, what happened to you in the trauma-informed care field? Well, yes, we want, we don't want people to ask what's wrong with us. We want to say what's happened to us, but we also want to ask what is right with us in acknowledgement of that individuals have the ability to be agents in the creation of their own well-being. Thus, you know, we are not our trauma. So a healing-centered engagement approach, which is founded by um, 
Dr. Sean Ginray, it goes into just that. It moves beyond that individual, individualistic trauma-informed perspective. It also recognizes collective trauma or systemic traumas. We know when individuals are experiencing numerous traumas from uh, communities that they may not may resonate with, and thus that could be an injustice in itself, systemic trauma when it's a, a peer um, when it is experienced collectively. So a healing-centered approach addresses to addressing trauma requires a different question that moves beyond what's happened to you, to what's right with you, and views those exposed to trauma as agents in the creation of their own well-being rather than victims of traumatic events. And there are four key elements to healing-centered engagement that may at times overlook with current trauma-informed practices. But what it does offer is several key distinctions. Healing-centered engagement is explicitly political or policy focused rather than clinical. Communities and individuals who experience trauma are agents in restoring their own well-being. This subtle shift suggests that healing from trauma is found in an awareness and actions that address the, the conditions that create the trauma in the first place. Creates a sense of accountability. Now healing-centered engagement is culturally grounded and views healing as the restoration of identity. And so the pathway to restoring well-being among young people, for example, who experience trauma can be found in culture and ide identity. Thus healing-centered engagement uses culture as a way to ground people in a solid sense of, of me um, meaning, self-perception and purpose. Healing-centered engagement is asset-driven and focuses on well-being and a want rather than symptoms that we want to suppress. Healing-centered engagement often um, offers an import, important departure from solely viewing people through the lens of harm and focuses on asset-driven strategies that highlight possibilities for well-being. And lastly, healing-centered engagement supports uh, also adult providers as well as young people and their own healing. Adult providers need healing too. Healing-centered engagement requires that we consider how to support adult providers in sustaining their own healing and well-being. We cannot presume that adulthood is final and thus a trauma-free destination. And lastly, we are more than what has happened to us. And so um, I often uh, just done so many work in racial truth and reconciliation space. I used to work for the Truth Telling Project um, as well. And so came, there is this intersectional model essentially to how we reach um, that I refer to as the pillars of truth and reconciliation. And so it is that concept of truth telling, right? Because storytelling is a cure um, in, uh, for silence. And truth telling can be done uh, with white people have truths to tell as well as people of color. Um, it's it, but it's an acknowledging the truth and the story of behind past injustices and coming to terms with a period of conflict, upheaval, or injustice. Um, there's also the concept of reconciliation, which is a, a process that acknowledges the truths and but also the making of amends, made and tell a public apology. Um, or or, uh, or proposed apologies or agreements amongst peers who, who have done wrong. And then I've talked about healing-centered engagement, but there's also repair and reparations. Just, uh, people have you know, an obligation to repair the harms caused, whether that's in form of reparations you know, at the state or national level, but essentially reparations publicly affirms that um, the victims and rights to their entitled redress. So healing-centered um, attributes of storytelling include the antidote to moral in injury, the damage done to one's own conscious or moral compass when a person perpetu uh, perpetrates or witnesses or fails to prevent acts of transgress. transgress. Um, there's, uh, Storytelling also can uh, serve as a disruption of intergenerational inter cycles of trauma. Sometimes Christians refer to it as generational curses. And then lastly, it is leaned into cultural identity to face the um, identity-based traumas that one has experienced. 
Now, there's a long history of storytelling. It originates with visual, visual stories such as cave drawings and then shifts into oral traditions in which stories are passed down from generation to generation by word of mouth. So oral, oral storytelling is telling a story, for example, through voice and gestures. The oral tradition can take many forms, including epic poems, chants, rhymes, songs, and more. There was then from a shift from oral, right? into narratives, including written, printed, and typed stories when we look at history. Storytelling can also be used as a powerful tool to preserve autonomy over one's narrative, culture, and generational traditions, and additionally influence policy and legal discourse, such as in the case of Plessy versus Ferguson and Brown versus Board of Education. And now it's often important to note that once traditions shifted from oil to writing and scribing literature and other forms of writing are often dominated by Western cultural norms. Thus, when we tell our stories through our lenses and our truths and through our own creative styles, we're countering norms, um, narratives and practices. Who determines what forms of narrative storytelling and practices are uh, acceptable and just can be easily understood? So I learned in my undergrad as a um, English creative writing major that there are ways in which we can counter dominant cultural norms by writing and narrating in whatever way we wish to do so. I'm gonna further delve into this concept. Uh, let's see, doing pretty good. On time of what happens when others tell our story. Um, and so I'm gonna um, first, just play this video and then we'll further uh, process it together. For most of my life, I've been caught in between who I really am and how I'm perceived. When the Oscar So White hashtag took off in 2015, it drew attention to a larger conversation around whose stories get told and recognized. In 2016, the nominations came out and again, there were no people of color in any of the acting categories. But it's equally important to discuss how black stories have been told. The network does not want to see Negroes on television unless they are buffoons. There's a long history of grotesque, racist caricatures depicting black people as childlike, animalistic, or lazy. And there's a war old man who don't do nothing but tell stories. In order to justify slavery and the systemic mistreatment of black people. When you mock or belittle us, you enforce an existing system. Versions of these caricatures carried over into our earliest blockbuster movies and remained popular on screen. If you don't care what folks says about this family, I do. In large part because while black characters have always been a part of American films, black filmmakers and sometimes even performers tended to be excluded from their creation. If we look closer, numerous anti-black stereotypes persevere in some form to this day across our films, TV shows, and culture. When Shonda Rhimes writes her autobiography, it should be called How to Get Away with Being an Angry Black Woman. Here's our take on the history of black stereotypes on screen, where they come from, and how they still influence our society today much more pervasively than you might think. Cops everywhere staring down the barrel of a gun at a black man don't see a human being. They see a caricature, a thug. So I think you all clearly see the kind of direction I, well, at least the, the direction I wanted you to learn from, um, from this, but there are preconceptions and myths that often shape, for example, Black criminality or Muslim terrorism, and this places the burden on those most impacted to prove that this stereotype is wrong. Examples of this can um, be Hillary Clinton's war on drugs, uh, building the wall, the Chinese Exclusion Act. So there are examples of how these stereotypes have been really, really dangerous um, and encourage folks to consider a time where someone did misspeak for you or told a story um, or, or a way in which you may have done the same on behalf of someone else. Um, so there, are, and then I will say there are there are uh, depictions of my own community that occur uh, in film. Um, Boys in the Hood. Um, I know Martin and Gina. It's like why are they always arguing? Um, but you know, there's several other films that don't display other cultures in the good light. And I will say when you're not from that culture or say you grew up in a white picket fence neighborhood and never surrounded yourself 
around Black people, for example, that might very much be the way that you in mainstream culture or even globally, globally the way in which that culture is seen. And so that's why those kinds of depictions in film are so dangerous, especially for people who don't spend time um, with other Black people or minorities or uh, any other sub subgroups. For most of my life, I've been... And so thus, um, you know, we fight the power with the power. And I don't, a power possesses an array of meanings for different people. It takes on various forms. But within, but within the context of justice, I want to clarify power over, power to, and power from. So social power highlights the relationship between empowerment and power through a set of organized principles and a cycle of organized activity. For the purpose of this component um, of my presentation, note that the social movements such as the women's movement in the 1960s and the rise of the Black Panther Party were rooted in the ability that individuals should have a fair share of power and should have greater influence and control over important matters in their life. So to combat the unfair distribution of power, one must specifically name the power as well as um, the form of empowerment. Thus, empowerment, which should not be used loosely, um, empowerment initiatives impact individuals, organizations, communities, and society, requiring that the process of empowerment is approached by a critically um, multi-level lens. So I will uh, ultimately summarize, summarize that empowerment entails control over resources in such a way that people can be um, used to, uh, it, it essentially uh, expresses the control over resources in such a way that people can have um, control um, over their own rewards, the ability to control barriers such as the participation through um, defining what we talk about and how we talk about it. Uh, one example is expert power. And some people uh, talk about others, including others with lived experiences of oppression. And then it also shapes a, for, a force that uh, shapes shared consciousness through uh, myths, ideology, and control over information. Now, there are several examples of power if we want to get really, really specific, but I'll uh, quickly kind of cover the structural power consists of the structural domain, which consists of institutional structures of society, including government, the legal system, housing powers, and economic traditions. Discipl disciplinary power domains consist of ideas, practices that characterize and sustain um, bureaucratic hierarchies. Hegemonic power um, impacts, for example, healthcare policies and ways in which providers may treat patients. It consists of images, symbols, ideas, and ideologies that shape social consciousness. And then lastly, uh, interpersonal power. This is the interpersonal domain, which consists of patterns of interaction between individuals and people. So when we talk about racism and the roots of impression, and when we tell our stories, I'd like to really go into the specifics as to uh, which power impacts the narrative or which uh, power can the narrative influence. Now we often witness legal or policy, policy storytelling all the time without the categorization of such. Do we remember the story of Trayvon Martin, George Floyd, say their names, hashtag, for example, as a form of digital storytelling in a movement to ensure people are gone but never for, forgotten. It puts the hands and the power of the people to tell the truth and to counter the narratives of injustice and racism. Thus, counter stories investigate the factual background and the pieces of the story that may be frequently ignored, such as uh, separate but equal. It builds off of the everyday experiences of people and their perspectives and viewpoints. This is known as literally a theory uh, called narrative change theory. Now, storytelling at its new roots occurs in a variety of communities. Gatekeeping of stories is often perpetuated to continue limiting marginalized communities. Um, and so storytelling, we know, shares voice, validity, and connection, especially when it comes to minorities 
who are survivors of discrimination and often may blame themselves for the oppression or have a roll off my back approach. So stories give people a voice and it reveals that we are not alone and other people share similar stories. Powerfully written stories and narratives begins the process of correction in our systems and beliefs that may have perhaps been neglected by evidence. Now, there are many culture um, ways in which cultures have shared stories, slave narratives, um, tell the tales of black captives to um, describe the, gent the um, gentility that is often depicted behind slavery. Other forms of storytelling include history of folk spirituals, um, for example, and other cultures such as indigenous practice, uh, peoples, storytelling is used as a history and myth to preserve cultures and remind um, the common group of its destiny. And then in Hispanic or Latino societies, novelists may poke at rough, dishonest, dishonest but appealing heroes or make sly fun of countless behaviors or social norms that we all engage in without thinking of it, such as puffed up nobility or, or bigotry. Now, different um, is a concept that explains the value of the narrative for groups impacted by historical marginalization. It occurs between the concept, for example, justice holds two different meanings for two different groups. Now, when we lack the language to describe how we have been wronged, it deprives us of a chance to express that, that wrong in ways that the system will understand. For example, Latino or Hispanic populations may suffer from harsh workplace conditions, but may be unable to speak up due to risk of being deported. So these are populations impacted by what is known as defriend or narr but narratives provide language that bridge the gaps in understanding and, and conceptions that perpetuate different. All right. And so I often say, um, you know, your stories connect you to your gifts and your gifts will connect you to um, people who matter or share similarities and furthermore, who believe in you. So stories are often deprived from the roots, uh, which could be pain, passion, purpose, or opportunity. And arguably this is what creates your calling or your destiny. Let's see. Okay, all right. So this is an activity um, that often I would uh, do with you all one-on-one, -on -one, but uh, because this is a Zoom webinar, I'm going to uh, model the activity for you, but leave you with the resources to do it in your own. So this is the concept of um, what I refer to as social identity, storytelling, or, or truth-telling. And often before I walk people through this exercise, um, I like to explore um, yes, the concept, you know, we are sharing our story, but I want to acknowledge that there are silent stories that often go unheard of because of people, because people are simply not asked to tell their stories. Think of, I think of my grandmother or my grandfather who the questions I did not ask um, and thus were not told um, per certain pieces of their stories. There are secret stories or stories that will not be told because an individual does not feel empowered to share their story. And sometimes there may be underlying pain or hurt or guilt or shame or other emotions in connection to the story. And so sometimes these stories are referred to as secret stories or hidden stories. However, what's more important than labels are that people have autonomy over the stories they choose to share. And there are advocates or individuals that only feel comfortable, maybe comfortable sharing a piece of their story, but not all of it. And so um, with that being said, we decide on the stories we choose to share and what shapes our narratives and what we want people to know most about those stories. So in this exercise, social identity storytelling, have people go through first their ethnic or cultural background um, in connection to the class they were raised in and then in connection to their social identities and how those social identities impact their uh, positions or, or leadership in society personally as well as professionally. 
And so in my worksheet, um, which I'll send examples of these slides, but it kind of walks you through the crafting of that social identity storytelling. And this is an exercise that has been used by public officials running for public office, as well as advocates um, wanting to tell their story in support of policy. And so it can be crafted in, in, in a way of, as such um, as a model to use for other forms of storytelling. Uh, now, every Voices staff member has also been through this exercise, so if you want to see examples of other stories, you can visit our website. Uh, where it, oh, I did that wrong. It's actually youtube.com slash VA Voices. I'll correct that, um, but it is, oh no, it's on our website too, but anywho, um, you can find it more easily on YouTube. And now I'm just going to walk you through my social identity story as an example um, before we begin uh, wrapping up. So hello, my name is Chloe Edwards. I was born in Richmond, Virginia. I'm a cis educated black woman, one of two people in my family with a master's degree and a professional in the policy and advocacy field. Like many black people, I do not know where I am from precisely, but I do hope to find and visit home one day I was raised by a single mother and am a triplet. Growing up, my mother was in survival mode and made it a goal to provide food, clothing, and shelter. She was raised in the projects and clean houses for, houses for a wealthy white man in the suburbs. And after that experience, she made it a goal to raise her children in the West End of Richmond one day so that we could have access to the better schools. And now we were poor and often learned to live without. It humbled me. I remember stuff, uh, stuffing a half gallon of ice cream down my throat so that it wouldn't go bad when the electricity was shut off. One of my favorite Christmases was one in which we were challenged to pick one toy from under the tree while blowing clouds of smoke in the house with no heat. As triplets, we always had each other, but sometimes it felt like we were alone. Later on in my childhood, I witnessed my biological father endure the cycle of substance use and incarceration, and my mother coped with mental health challenges. She was often on edge and faced extreme paranoia. There were times when we learned to, uh, where we locked ourselves inside of the house when the windows were glued down with no way to get out. One day I ran away from home wearing black shorts, Timberlands, and a pink cami in the middle of December. I called the police asking for help, which took a great deal of courage as in my childhood, the police were constantly locking my father up. Yet I was told by a white male police officer that he used to be a rebellious child like me and learned to be quiet. After returning home, I was kicked out with no clothes and told that they would be all donated to the Goodwill. Now later I entered kinship foster care and not all of my siblings were willing to speak, therefore we were separated. But I've always been a natural leader. In my childhood, I was Mama Chloe. I don't remember ever being a child. I specialize in all that I have gone through. My lived experience of PTSD directly informs my passion to combat cultural, racial, and historical trauma. I advocate for public health, trauma-informed care, racial equity, and justice. I have been the youngest in any profession I have worked in. Oftentimes, my ideas are undervalued and my credibility is challenged that I am often the only black woman with a seat at the table and it is imperative that I use my voice. I've learned to value my gut. I'm forward thinking, my ideas are innovative and progressive, often challenge traditional practices so that conditions that maintain the status quo are no longer sustained. I stand on the shoulder of my ancestry and the paths they tread and others that have created other paths for me. I'm the proud finder of the Racial Truth and Reconciliation Virginia campaign, the president of Black Lives Matter 804, board member of the Hive Movement, and I'm Just Me Movement. I'm an advocate and activist, a policy analyst, racial equity facilitator, trauma trainer, and good trouble leader. And I am an agent of change and the embodiment of my story. So again, this is an, an exercise that you can I know at Voices, I, we actually processed this with other staff members and all of us got an opportunity to share our stories and create a storytelling circle. But it's also an um, exercise that you can um, do individually and practice as well. 
Now, I mentioned that there are other ways that you can craft your stories for advocacy. Of course, if you're a public employee, um, there are some restrictions, but you can always advocate in your personal time. Um, and so this is a similar exercise that would be more specific to a meeting, for example, with a public official. But you can still craft, use that exercise um, in order to craft the story more strategically. Now, the storytelling exercise that I um, modeled for you would usually be no more than four minutes. So you should practice um, your social identity storytelling within that four minute time frame. Now, I mentioned who can advocate. Um, uh, if you're a nonprofit employee, you can also advocate, but not on public. Um, funding, for example. Um, but if you want to really get nitty gritty with the rules, visit voteradvocacy.com. Uh, much of what we practice today is actually rooted in my research. Um, I do have a presentation that I did around um, a high level overview of the research I have been doing at the University of Richmond. Um, prior to its completion. So if interested in that, you can check that out on the Voices YouTube as well. And in closing, um, I'm gonna do, let's see. Okay, in closing, instead of my calm bubble, I'm gonna end with just a, another proverb, which is so Sankofa and the idea of Sankofa, which uh, depicts a bird with its turned head and what Sankofa means is um, it addresses the concept of going back to get it or going back to get what was left behind. And I think this is quite a, quite a quite timely depiction of justice and the concept of we, how we have to go back and fetch what is at risk of being left behind. So I will end with a 